Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's Café Pause. Each week, we check in with a journalist based in Germany to talk about the news stories behind the headlines. And today, I am delighted to welcome ACG Young Leader alumna Dana Heide. She has been a Berlin-based correspondent for the Handelsblatt since the summer of 2022 and currently covers the German foreign office and international politics. Dana, herzlich willkommen. Thank you for joining us. It is always great to see you. Steve, thanks for having me. So, as you know, um, I often like to begin by asking our Café Pause guests a little bit about the Stimmung, the political mood in Berlin and in Germany. And I thought, especially after all of the news reports over the weekend, that that would be a good place for us to start today. What is the atmosphere in pro political Berlin like today? Yeah, I mean, right now, I think the, the biggest topic is the terror attacks in Moscow and what it might mean for uh, potential threats to uh, German citizens as well. Uh, the interior minister has already said that it remained the threat uh, for terrorist attacks in Germany also uh, remains, uh, you know, imminent. Uh, so uh, there is this potential for Islamic terror here in Germany as well. I mean, I think uh, we've been better off than other countries in this regard. Um, the last really big, um, really big attack was in 2016. There was this, um, the attack, the Islamic attack on uh, the Christmas market in Berlin. Um, but after that, we've had some terror attacks, but um, smaller ones, uh, mostly uh, with knives. And uh, there was there was one that that made headlines uh, where um, Islamists attacked uh, people in um, in trains with knives. Um, several people died doing those attacks, um, but we did not have um, really big ones like the one in in Moscow in in the in the past years. And I think that's, I mean, that's obviously the the dominant story um, at the at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of news around it. Um, I had heard some reporting that there were concerns both in Berlin and in Paris um, about what could happen next, um, particularly with a view to some of the big sporting events that are scheduled to take place. Um, soccer series in Germany, the Olympic Games in France. Um, and that there was real concern, but I was a little surprised, um, I guess on, on Deutschland Radio, I heard that, um, although you just said that the, the Minister of the Interior said that, you know, we need to be concerned in Germany about the possibility of attacks, it sounded as if um, the, the sense was Germany needed to be concerned before the attacks in Moscow and is equally concerned today, not that the threat level has necessarily gone up. Um, has the atmosphere been one where one's been afraid of these kinds of attacks prior to, to what happened in Moscow over the weekend? I think ever since the Christmas uh, incident, Christmas attack, um, everybody is um, always has mixed feelings when, uh, you know, Germans go to those kind of events. Um, and there's been increased uh, security um, measures as well uh, from the side of the police. Um, several places they have those you know those new security pollers so it's not it's not as easy to drive through with a uh with a truck and and hurt people like it like it happened uh in uh, during the christmas market in 2016 um i mean there is increased tension but um i agree i think you know the german uh authorities were concerned even before um this attack in moscow mm -hmm. um and and how has has the response been from Germany vis-a-vis -vis Moscow um, in light of of these attacks? I mean, of course, um, there's been a huge sense of trepidation with regard to to Moscow and, and the Kremlin uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, even now, following the the so-called election um, in Russia last weekend, where um, Vladimir Putin was given another six-year term. Um, What's what's the direct response uh, from Berlin to Moscow been following the attacks? 
I think what has been made very clear is that um, Germany also, German government also thinks it was the IS who, the Islamic State, uh, this terror terror group that committed those attacks and not as, uh, you know, I mean, Putin suggested that there might be links to Ukraine. And I think uh, the German the German government was uh, was very clear that they think it's it was the, the Islamic State and that's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, not to not to uh, give in to those um, obvious propaganda uh, from the from the Russian side. Mm-hmm. So obviously um, heightened sort of alert, um, heightened threat assessment following these attacks. Um, but I think you know this is a, a good segue to talk a little bit about um, the war in Ukraine because there continues to be uh, a debate um, in Germany about different positions. I guess over the weekend, um, Kevin Kunat uh, criticized the whole debate with um, SPD um, uh, Bundestag member Wolf Mützenich and his sort of idea of freezing um, the conflict in order for there to be negotiations between um, Kiev and and Moscow to bring the war to an end. Can you give us an update on on sort of where things stand in terms of the domestic positioning on the war in Ukraine? So, yeah, we had this, um, this uh, you know, speech of uh, SPD, Social Democratic uh, Parliamentary Group leader, uh, Rolf Mützenich, um, a couple of uh, days ago, um, it was in a during a parliamentary debate about uh, actually the Taurus um, and uh, weapon uh, weapon systems in general um, to 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 go to the Ukraine, um, and he said something like, um, you know, we should also think also think about um, the to freeze uh, think about freezing the conflict in the Ukraine. And that, of course, uh, you know, caused a huge outrage, um, especially in the within the coalition parties, FDP and Grüne. And you know, it's they 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 already mentioned and they they said it before. It's it's not it's not the right time to uh, to talk about this because um, that would give uh, you know that would be a success for Putin. And uh, we had this those kind of. Um, um, you know, they tried this uh, actually in uh, in you know before, and it didn't work. Uh, it 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 led to the situation where we are now. So if we give in to Putin right now, then this would cause huge damages uh, in the future, and would probably trigger him to even uh, go further and attack other countries or go further in the Ukraine. So there was huge backlash. Um, you know, he was criticized very harshly. Um, I think within the SPD, it's uh, there's the 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 mood is mixed. Uh, there's not not everybody thinks you know it's this is not a good idea to 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 uh, start the discussion discussion now. Um, the SPD look, it's they they've had this this these good experiences with uh with the policy towards uh towards the east um long time ago and and people are still hoping that maybe you can talk to russia and maybe uh you know put this conflict to a stop uh somehow in this way but um in general this is not the opinion of most most of the people here, I think. Mm-hmm. And I mean, do you still see sort of divisions within the coalition government when it comes to um, how to to sort of manage the next steps in the war in Ukraine and between the government and the opposition? Can you sort of shed some light on that for us? Definitely, definitely. There's uh, frictions within the coalition, and there's frictions between the opposition and the um, and the government as well. Uh, so there's been a debate about uh, the weapon system Taurus um, for weeks now. Uh, at first, the chancellor was was hesitant to even give a clear position on that. He just you know hesitated to del- to to give a yes to deliver it. 
-hmm. but uh, a couple of weeks ago he said he said he stated a clear no he doesn't want to to give uh to give them this uh, weapon system um and at first again uh he did not give reasons and then he they were in, there were there were some reports and in the end uh, we now have a clearer picture of why he doesn't uh, want to give the Taurus system weapon system to Ukraine um and maybe I don't know if 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 you're interested in that if we if we if we go more to detail to 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 that but I think this is the this is the nucleus of what uh, the debate is about. Um, the uh, the parts of the coalition they think that those um, concerns that uh, Scholz has in delivering this weapon system uh, can be met somehow and can be set aside. Uh, can be can be there can be a solution to those problems, mm -hmm. and so they the weapon system could be delivered to to Ukraine and uh, the chancellor obviously thinks that, you know, there's no solution to those problems that he sees, to those risks that he sees, yeah. he doesn't want to send them. So so let's talk a little bit about some of the reasons why Scholz seems so steadfast about not supplying this weapon system to Ukraine. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with his not wanting to see an escalation of the conflict and, and Germany somehow be drawn into the conflict. Um, and yet it's making it very difficult for Ukraine to actually win if it does not have the equipment that it that it needs. Um, and this has been one of the sort of fundamental dividing points, I think, in that in that debate. So can you share with us a little bit more about why Scholz is so steadfast about about not providing the Taurus cruise missiles? Right. So. The he thinks that, uh, or at least that's what he's shared uh, with the public. Um, he thinks he wants to prevent that Ukraine could potentially use this system to attack targets within Russia, because he thinks this would be an escalation, um, and the Taurus could do that because it's a wide-ranging uh, uh, weapon system. So a solution could be that German soldiers control help with the with the with controlling the target, mm -hmm. help to help to control the weapon system. But then German soldiers would be involved, and then the Chancellor thinks uh, this might uh, you know Putin might interpret this as an escalation from the German side, and Germany could be an even bigger target um, in his uh, in his in his view. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, there's some debates about, but maybe somebody else could control it and, uh, or maybe he should just trust the Ukrainians. Um, so I think it's a lot of, uh, you know, you can have, you can argue both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's, yeah, what, what is a little bit, uh, what is, I think what annoys the chancellor the most is that, um among this uh this debate the the huge support that germany is giving to ukraine uh, is kind of like sidelined it's mm -hmm. uh yes the Taurus is important um and it would be the best to uh give all all the weapons that we have to ukraine in order for them to to win this and to win this fast uh, because it costs a lot of money. It, it, it binds a lot of resources. Um, there's a lot of uh, human suffering involved. Um, but yeah, it's um, that we are still, Germany is still doing a lot of other things and, and mm -hmm. Taurus will not be the only, the one system that, um, uh, you know, makes it, makes the difference. It, it, it won't be. Um, so but yeah, um, then there's this debate about uh, a possible Ringtausch with yeah. uh, with Great Britain. Uh, Handelsblatt was uh, uh, the first the first to report it, and well, that was already like a couple of weeks ago. So that has been going on for a long time too. Right. Um, where uh, so so like Germany would give its Taurus to uh, Britain, uh, and yeah. they give their shadow system which is a similar system to ukraine and then that, that way we wouldn't be involved yeah well and and of course 
there's another sort of story that was just breaking, um, I guess, Sunday night when it comes to, to missiles. Um, Russia launched a huge attack with missiles and drones on Kyiv and the western region of Lviv um, on Sunday. And it made many Europeans incredibly nervous because there was confirmation that a Russian missile um, entered Polish airspace on Sunday. And there was a lot of concern that things could escalate. Um, I guess the that Polish and NATO F-16s were activated to respond to the incursion. Um, it was not a long incursion, but it has really um, created a mood of even more unease um, in Europe uh, and, and within NATO. To what degree has that been a topic of discussion um, in Berlin today? So far, I haven't seen that much about this, but uh, that might be because I'm focused on other other things. Yeah. Uh, but um, I mean, yeah, the the threat is there, and 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 that's probably why uh, why Chancellor Charles wants to be seen as you know a moderate figure in this in this whole conflict. Um, because yeah, uh, the Germans have gone a long way, you know, you, you know as, as as good as I do, um, when it comes to supporting, um, you know, Ukraine in this in this conflict. So, and in general, in general, the 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 whole landscape of of German public opinion has changed so much in the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. It, it really is incredible when it comes to defense and security policy. So mm -hmm. he probably knows that. And, and that's why he's like being so, he wants to appear calm and moderate and not do anything that would be over the top. Yeah. I mean, there was a, a very interesting poll on Friday um, released by ZDF about a number of, of foreign policy and national security issues. And it was very interesting to see that, um, I guess just under two thirds um, of those asked, 59% said that European states should deliver more weapons and munitions to Ukraine. 35% um, said that that was not the case. So you've got you know strong strong majority of respondents uh, in Germany who feel that that is the right way to go. But while we're talking about foreign policy, one of the other Questions that was asked um, had to do with the situation in Gaza, and it seems as if there's really growing criti crit criticism of Israel um, for its um, military actions uh, in Gaza, uh, despite the high number of civilian casualties. I think um, it was almost 70% of those who were against um, or, or did not feel that, that Israel's actions were justified. Can you talk a little bit about um, the perspective of or perception of Israel right now in this conflict um, in Gaza, in, in Germany? So, I mean, it's when I talk to people here in, uh, in politics in Berlin, it's uh, every time I talk to them, the, the situation is even worse. They, like a couple of weeks ago already, they said like, you know, it's catastrophic. The humanita humanitarian situation there is horrible. People are dying, children are suffering. Uh, there's not enough food, there's not enough water. Um, you know, diseases are about to get worse, um, are spreading. Um, so, and this is every time I talk to them, every time it's even worse. It, it, it was la it was horrible last time, but now it's like more horrible. And then it's like more and more horrible. It's There's no words. Um, and the German government is is changing its tone on that as well. They always, they are always uh, checking with, with the US um, on their position uh, about, on Israel. Mm -hmm. But when the because the U.S. is all also changing their view a little bit and their tone on 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 the Israeli uh, Israeli government the the German government is is changing their tone as well. Baerbock, uh, foreign minister German foreign minister Annalena Baerbock is uh, on her way to Israel right now. She should be there this minute. Um, mm -hmm. First in Egypt, now in Israel, she's meeting with uh, the Palestinians, and then tomorrow she's meeting with the uh, Israelis, and and I'm sure she will address this um, again. But there's not so much that 
Germany can do in this regard. I think uh, the German government can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's, you know, one of the interesting things that this poll said was that um, uh, respondent, I guess, 87% of respondents believe that the West should put more pressure on Israel um, to stop uh, the, the, the military actions that they're that they're taken, um, and even to help um, supply food and, and medicine in order to help the people on the ground in in Gaza. Um, I guess everybody is looking for whatever leverage they might have, and that's got to be part of the reason why Baalbek is traveling to the region right now. It seems as if it's you know it's it, any any way that she can. Um, to to apply pressure, uh, pressure. I guess um, Chancellor Scholz was in the region last week, if I right. remember correctly. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it does seem as if Germany is actively trying to to play a role. But as you said, that it's limited as to how much influence um, Berlin can actually have. Yeah, and it's. I mean the. Yeah, it's the Israeli government is really not helping in this regard. They are not. I mean, they there's been some. Uh, there there was a like uh, there were children rescued. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, in uh, with within the um, uh, within the area of the Palestinians and and you know transferred to a safer place. Um, and the Israelis agreed to that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so there is like teeny tiny steps, I I would say, but in general, it's it's just getting worse and worse, and nobody, like at least here in the in the government in the politics, understands why they're why they are doing that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It's yeah. Um, Dana, I'd I'd like to stick with international and and talk a little bit about China. Of course, you're an expert on China, having served as Handelsblatt's um, correspondent in China for three years, and it's part of your portfolio now in terms of covering the German Foreign Office, but also focusing specifically on German-China relations as well as the German government's policy toward China. And I guess I I sort of worry a little bit that with all of the focus. Um, going uh, to other issues like the ones that we've talked about already, the war in Ukraine, the situation in Gaza, um, people are maybe not paying as much attention to China as they as they should. Um, as a China watcher, uh, what are you watching at the moment and what should we be keeping an eye on when it comes to, to China? I totally agree. <laughs> with your assessment uh, that might be a little bit naturally because I have a special eye on China, but yeah. uh, I think in general it's, it's underreported. Um, we need to have a, a stronger focus on that. Um, that of course has to do with so many more, uh, I mean, the conflicts that we are seeing Ukraine uh, it's just, of course they are more, they seem more urgent, uh, but what is happening in, in regards to China is, you know, it's it's not stopping. Uh, it, it it doesn't matter if there's a lot of focus on there. It it doesn't it doesn't stop. The topics uh, don't stop. Um, so I think in the ne next few years there might be more attention on this uh, because the chancellor is um, traveling to uh, to Beijing in the middle of uh, April. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not official yet, but those are the plans that I'm hearing and. Um, and there he will uh, meet with his counterparts, and and he will be uh, um, th there will be a, a, a business delegation traveling with him, um, as it was uh, Usos in the in the last few uh, visits. Um, it will be another like the, the last time he was there. I remember because I was I was with him uh, was during the COVID uh, crisis where China had insanely <laughs> strict measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just a day. Uh, it was just, I think it was 11 hours that he was there. So a very quick in and out. Uh, everybody had to um, had to take a, a COVID test. Um, there was even one person who was not allowed to leave the um, hotel because it was positive. So he, uh, this poor guy had to stay in, a, in, a, in the hotel the whole time. Well, anyways, this will be a much more normal uh, mm -hmm. visit this time. He will be there several days. 
uh, he will probably be visiting another city as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, the delegation will be uh, bigger, but not as big as uh, it used to be um, in the in the Merkel years. So uh, it shows that um, you know things have changed. Um, and yeah, that's that maybe maybe for that. Um, but you ask about um, but you ask about about the topics and what I'm looking at. So but, but let, let me maybe pick up on this on this first before you go to some of these other topics. Um, and and that is you know particularly after the release of um, Berlin's China strategy last year, which um, indicated sort of a much um, more careful approach to China um, and you know certainly wanting to find redundancies uh, to reduce the dependence on China from a government standpoint. But there seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect between the government position and German business and industries position and viewpoint on China, where there's still a great interest in investing in China and maintaining strong economic ties. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what you will be watching when Scholz is there with this business delegation um, and that there might be two different sort of sets of interests, if you will, that are being pursued on this trip? So I think that, yeah, of course, the, the topics will be, I mean, it, 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 you know, when, when politicians, when German politicians travel to China nowadays, it has nothing to do with what happened before um, 2022 or before, before COVID crisis. Um, before that, it was all signing contracts, pushing, pushing investments, uh, pushing the, Bilateral trade. Um, this is not the main topic anymore. Um, there's more. There will be the usual addressing of uh, problems, mm -hmm. which uh, have become more complex as well. Uh, and I mean, Schultz is not known for a very direct tone towards China. Um, but uh, last time he was there, I have to say he uh, he he clearly um, sent a, a different message uh, to 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 the Chinese government than Merkel ever did. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of there was a lot of criticism. There was a lot. There was a lot less. Uh, you know, let's talk, let's work together on trade. Um, so my guess is that this will be. I mean, he cannot go back from mm -hmm. that. I think. I think this is the new tone and um, this will be one of the topics that is like going to address uh, what is not going well. He will, he will most certainly address Taiwan. Um, the, the thing about the dependency um, that is more, uh, you know, he, he has to address this in dialogue with the companies actually, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the government has to come up with ways to like strategic and and more structured ways uh how to convince the the companies to really diversify from china mm -hmm. and that is it's a little you know it's lacking behind and uh you know when i think back when i first got here in 2022 when it really picked up the discussion was huge there was this incident with costco or this incident it's not an incident the the um case case of costco who uh wanted to buy part of the port in uh hamburg uh it was a huge discussion um everybody looked at china um it was sexy to talk about china when you were a politician and now this is like it's kind of like it's not that sexy anymore and i feel like there's not a lot of things that have happened. There have been there have been some has been some progress in, in terms mm -hmm. of diversifying, but not that much. Mm -hmm. Um sort of related to this and, and some of the things that might be on the agenda, one of our viewers is curious um whether Schultz will raise China's obligations on North Korea sanctions and DP, DPRK arms transfers to Russia during the trip, whether you think that's something that that will come up. That's a good question. I cannot answer this at this yeah. point. 
<laughs> well, but so let me let me come back to you know the direction that you were were going in when it comes to China um, as a a frequent China watcher. Um, and as it relates to the bilateral relationship between Germany and China or the relationship between China and Europe, what are the the issues that you're watching at the moment? So one of the biggest issues uh, in China, German relations and China, Europe, Europe relations is overcapacities. Mm -hmm. The Chinese economy has not been doing well for several years now, especially in the COVID times, but now but now it hasn't really picked up. Demand hasn't really picked up, um, but the industry is still producing a lot of stuff. So this needs to, um, you know, somebody else needs to buy this. Um, and it's not the Chinese because demand is so is, is low and they have a, they have had a huge problem with uh, the real estate uh, um, uh, sector and it's still ongoing. It's a huge crisis. Um, so they what are they doing is they are exporting this um, those products to to Germany, to Europe. Uh, and this is causing a lot of tensions because they the a lot of those uh companies are so big and can uh can produce under with 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 such low uh, on such low, low costs um that they um sell their stuff in in Europe with uh, insanely uh low prices mm -hmm. there's a there's a um subsidy um investigation going on in Europe right now um that looks at ev like nev cars electric cars from china um, there's uh, there's fears of or there are already huge overcapacities in the solar sector, in the wind sector, steel, uh, cars, you name it. It's it's so many sectors, uh, and this will lead to more tensions. Um, so this is a topic that I look look at, um, and then I'm also interested in investments um, of China in uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that that uh the us is much more critical about that but but now you know things have changed in germany as well and uh the main responsible um economic ministry they they look at in investments like when when chinese companies want to buy german companies much more critical but not everybody in the government is is on this viewpoint they mm -hmm. not everybody sees it as critical so um there's there's this one company, for example, that um, wants to buy um, wants to buy uh, a gas turbine German company, German gas turbine company, and this Chinese company is uh, is intensely affiliated with um, Chinese uh, uh, industry, uh, um, Chinese uh, military uh, institutions, mm -hmm. and uh, when you know that. Uh, China has a problem with developing engines for its warships that it then uses or needs to, you know, potentially threat Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Then you know, that is, you know, those kind of deals that are critical and um, that should be looked at very carefully. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, I'm following that, for example. And um, yeah, this is this is something that sometimes goes under the radar, uh, intentionally so because the companies have no interest in in sharing and and the government doesn't either but um I think it's a it's a very interesting mm -hmm. interesting topic, yeah. so another question has come in um from somebody who's who's curious whether you see differences in the relationship between China and Germany and the relations between China and the Visegrad countries i.e Poland the Czech Republic Slovakia and, and Hungary sort of how would you distinguish between the two um, relationships from Beijing's perspective? I mean, the difference between uh, Hungary and uh, and Germany is pretty big, I think. China uses Hungary to as its ally kind of friend uh, in Europe and uses Hungary to uh, kind of get the foot into Europe. Um, so yeah, Poland, of course, it's much more critical. Um, but uh, everybody has those strong uh, economic ties with with China. And you know, it's it's they're using this, of course, to get their political to reach their political goals. and this everybody has in common. So it's mm -hmm. 
kind of like, yeah, this, this guy, I, I, all right. Sorry about that. No worries. Not at all. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to, another sort of story that relates to China that, that certainly made for headlines at the end of last week was um, that both both Russia and China vetoed a, um, a proposal by the U.S. or a call by the U.S. for a ceasefire in Gaza um, at the U.N. And it, it sort of made, made headlines um, that Russia and China were joining forces. And I guess I'd be, you know, curious, A, to hear um, about your thoughts on this veto at the UN by Russia and China, but also um, how you see the relationship between Beijing and Moscow developing um, in the in the short term. Uh, yeah, it's 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 well, I mean, it, it already has has they, they are already closer than ever, I think. In yeah. The last years. Um, We've seen that um, on the topic of Ukraine, um, but um, you know they are expanding their economic um, relationship. Uh, they are expanding their relationship when it comes to defense. They are um, working together in uh, military exercises. Um, they support each other on, uh, as you mentioned, the UN. Uh, in the UN, um, they support each other on the international level and on the yeah, Weltbühne, um, as as we say, uh, diplomatic, world stage. the world stage, yeah, um, diplomatic um, issues. Uh, so, and and they've, you know, they have they have sort of like the same goal when it comes to um, pushing the U.S. aside um, and making the world safer for autocracies like like their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also causing huge frictions with the German government, for example. It's mm -hmm. it's been a huge disappointment disappointment for the German government that uh that Russia that, that China is more or less on the side of Russia when it comes to Ukraine. And it still is. Uh there's there's no change. Uh the the, the the German uh, the Chinese foreign minister was uh, at the Munich Security Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you could tell that there's nothing there's nothing new uh, when it comes to their proposed peace plan or peace initiative um, that uh, Wang Yi proposed last time. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, and they they stand very close together on 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 issues that concern them both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when it comes to to foreign policy, that relationship is one to to watch um, in the in the future and to see um, how those ties might get strengthened. Um, maybe, maybe this, maybe one. What I think is very interesting as well. What, what is worth uh, you know mentioning is um, the the behavior of China in the Red Sea. Uh, I think this is a very interesting one. So this is a situation where everybody is suffering. Pretty much equally, um, we all have ships there: Germany, uh, the U.S., China as well. Uh, and even though we are all in the same boat, <laughs> this is mm -hmm. like unfortunate, but uh, we are all in the same boat. They um, they don't want to cooperate uh, in uh, protecting those ships from these uh, from the Houthis. Uh, they even go further. They they, they try to um, get some bilateral agreements with with the Houthis, uh, which doesn't work because mm -hmm. you cannot always distinguish uh, Chinese uh, from other chips. Uh, so, um, but they still don't want to cooperate, and this is kind of like the this really shows how deeply ingrained this aversion against working together with the U.S. is um, at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously that is something to watch as well as we think about supply chains um, and and further disruptions to the global economy. Um, but as we as we start to to come to a close, I guess, what are what are some of the other issues that you're watching um, and that you think we should be paying attention to both in terms of, of foreign policy and, and what the issues are that, that Berlin is following closely, but also in terms of what some of the domestic developments in Germany might be. I mean, I th I'm expecting a relatively slow news week when it comes to German politics, because um, I'm already getting 
lots of out of office messages that people are on holiday for Easter. Um, but but are there any things that you think we should be paying attention to um, in the in the coming weeks? Uh, so I think in general, what you can say the next few weeks uh, or the next few months uh, will be very interesting when it comes to uh, what domestic policy is, uh, is the upcoming elections in the Landtag, in the Länder, in uh, the eastern uh, states of Germany, uh, Thuringen, Sachsen and Brandenburg. Um, everybody's looking at that very closely and the the parties are already working towards this, uh, towards those dates, um, very important um, political um dates um and we've seen that uh you know the afd is still going very strong um in those in those states um still going very strong on um uh on state level as well on the like a federal level is that yeah is that the right word yeah federal mm -hmm. level as well uh so this will be something to definitely watch um as you said the next few days will be very calm <laughs> I don't. I mean, the, we will probably be talking about the the terror threats uh, maybe tomorrow as well, maybe this week. But then uh, there's not there's not really much going on those uh, in those days. It's I don't know I don't know how it is in the U.S., but here it's just very uh, very calm. Everybody goes mm -hmm. and has 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 some nice holidays with their families. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned the the three elections in the east in the fall, um, how much awareness, how much attention is being paid to the European elections, which are coming up more more quickly, right? In June, um, I guess the sixth to the ninth of June um, are when the EU elections uh, will take place. Uh, is that something that's on people's radar, or is that not as much of a fa factor? No, the average, I mean, especially like the average uh, German citizen, they don't really have this on their radar. Um, I mean, the the party, I think, also just started to push their uh, their candidates. So it's, um, you know, the campaigns are at the beginning. So we might see more of this, um, but in general, not a not a big mm -hmm. topic. Um yeah. And and I guess while we're talking about about domestic politics, um, you know, you're you're in Berlin, so you're a little bit closer, even if this is not um, an an issue that you follow um, for the Handelsblatt. But I'm curious whether you have any insights on what's going on in the opposition, um, the Christian Democrats, uh, the CDU, CSU. Um, I've heard a couple of reports that you know, obviously Friedrich Merz is the the head of the Christian Democratic Union um, is trying to position himself as chancellor, but there has been sort of some criticism of him from other corners within the CDU. Do you expect to see any infighting within the opposition party over leadership in the run up to next year's election? I would be surprised if that wouldn't happen uh, because of the polls uh, mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, Friedrich Merz is not a very popular candidate, uh, that's for sure. And there's they have other potential candidates, uh, namely uh, Markus Söder, the um, head of the Bavarian state, um, you know, pretty successful uh, politician when it comes to his um, uh, legacy in, in Bavaria. Um, he is uh, seen as you know, charismatic and he's a, like a doer he he gets things done um whereas uh, friedrich merz has uh, some problems uh, with with the german public um especially when it comes to young uh female voters but also but also other people um because of his past because of uh his like germans do not appreciate it when uh uh politicians have been in the um uh, in the economic sector, sector, and he worked mm -hmm. for work in a, in a, you know, in a, in a pretty uh, high position. So um, he uh, he's also like likes to show that he's he's not poor. He's uh, he you know he, he's a he's a pilot, so he likes to fly. Um, he has I think he has two planes, two private planes. Um, oh, okay. And, and that's not yeah, it's. Um, 
it doesn't resonate with the uh, with the with the German public very well, which is surprising probably for uh, for U.S. viewers because um, you know Donald Trump uh, has uh, obviously a lot of money and uh, people don't see this as a negative point in Germany. This is not, yeah, it's it's a little it's it's not that um, yeah it doesn't make it doesn't make a make a candidate more appealing to the German public. So that being said, I think. Zura kind of knows that he uh, he might be the better candidate uh, when you want to win, but uh, Friedrich Merz will not give in so easily. And, yeah. um, you know, so they are trying, the CDU now 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 is trying to like um, say, no, this is going to be fine. We don't, we, they are trying to push this down and they don't want to fight for, uh, for the candidacy, but um, you know, there's still a lot of time, and I would highly doubt. I I highly doubt that that there isn't will no will be no fighting from uh, from Zuda especially. Yeah, and is there are other in names China, in the mix. Uh, uh, Sorry, uh, he's in China this week, uh, by the way. I was Zuda. Uh, yeah, Zuda is in China. So, so they they you know they they probably think that um, it's a good idea to to talk to him because you yeah. might role in the uh in the german politics uh well in, and, of, and of course bavaria is an important economic powerhouse and so it makes sense um for for him to be there um i mean of course his name was in the mix last time around as a consular candidate as a, a candidate for chancellor and there are some other names um in the mix too hendrik wust the minister president of north rhine westphalia is somebody who who some people also think is possibly a candidate honestly i think it will end up coming down to um, at least partially what happens in the three state elections this fall. Um, if the CDU does badly, the likelihood is even greater that there will be infighting um, within the CDU over that leadership role. Um, if Friedrich Merz is able to to lead the party successfully in those elections, then, um, then maybe things will look different. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It, it, th that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm... Yeah. The, the 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 interesting elections will be in the fall um yeah. and uh, yeah in good and in bad ways i mean yeah the 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 rise of the the right uh extreme parties here is is of deep concern and and i think it will be the first time that this new um left uh, party is is going to uh put it be put at a test uh the the zara wagenknecht uh, yeah. uh Party. So this will be uh, interesting as well. Yeah. And it will be it will be very interesting to see sort of where she takes votes from um, from from other from other parties. So and obviously, it, at, sorry, this point, it's kind of, at this point, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's it's a little bit, you know, could could take from both both sides. Yeah, I mean, it could her party could take from the far left and from the far right. And so that remains to be seen. I mean, it 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 does seem as if the AFD numbers are a little bit lower than they were at the beginning of the year, um, but they do seem to be creeping up again uh, in some of the polls that I've seen. Um, and obviously, you know, we have the end of March right now. The elections in Eastern Germany are not until the fall, not until October. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot can happen between between now and then. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, Dana, herzlichen Dank. Many, many thanks. Um, as always, it was great to speak with you. And I want to thank you for covering sort of this wide swath of, of topics. Um, but it has been great to have you with us for today's Kaffeepause. Thank you so much for the time and always great to talk to you.